In 2001, my 24-year-old son, my firstborn, uh, my only child, only male child, was shot to death over a parking space. And um, Colleague was actually the second child I lost. I had a baby, a two and a half year old child who died of bacterial meningitis. During the death of Carlina uh, at two and a half, I met so many moms uh, as I ran a group called Compassionate Friends at Temple University. Uh, I met so many moms who had lost children to violence. And so uh, it was one of the things I dreaded and never wanted to hope to ever hear. But in 2003, uh, Colleague, my 24 year old son, was shot seven times over a parking space. So uh, initially, of course, I wanted to die. Didn't think I would survive another death of a child. Um, but at some point, I knew that I had to come out of my deep despair and do something about the issue of violence in our community. So that's how Mothers in Charge in 2003 was started. It was kind of my way of living and breathing and dealing with my pain and my tears and my anger and everything that I felt as a result of Kalik's death. And so initially, our goal was to uh, support families who have been impacted by violence and all those kinds of things, uh, advocate for families. And, but in doing so, you know, we wanted to find ways to improve the conditions and the quality of life in our community. So several years after the initial start of Mothers in Charge, we started to look at ways that our community was um, receiving injustice, unfair treatment, things like that, all kinds of things like that. And that's what took me into another whole area that we now work very diligently in, uh, criminal justice reform, um, looking at how we improve the quality of life of our communities. I think initially, uh, I probably didn't understand the criminal justice system. I had never really had to have been a part of it. Um, but in doing so and meeting so many people in our community that were impacted in so many different ways, I understood and had a better understanding uh, of what was actually the injustice and oppression and all of the police brutality and things that were going on in communities of color. A black child, a black man, didn't necessarily happen for a white person or a white child. You know, I had to explain to my child at 16 or 17 when he got his driver's license, you know, and I had a nice little Lexus then, I was a real diva, you know, um, what to do if you're stopped by the police. Because this is a fear. I'm in a very high-end boutique department store, and now I'm being followed around the store because someone thinks because I'm of a color, because I'm a black woman, that I may be trying to steal something. You know, um, being a black man driving a nice car, being stopped because you're perceived as a criminal. You know, things like that are difficult to live with, and it's a fear that we have. And I talk to even mothers today especially with what, what's going on today in our communities where young black men and women are shot down. There's police brutality going on in ways that we never knew about before. But I think now, because of George Floyd, we have, we've seen people around the country, no, around the world, standing up against this brutality. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So now you get to understand that maybe this could even happen, maybe to a family member. People that are standing up saying, no, this is wrong. You know, standing up against wrong. And anyone and everyone should be concerned enough about it to do something about it. You know, they need to be, a, if you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I'm hopeful that this new uh, movement that we see now in communities across the country will stand up, but we also need to see change at the top because that's where it starts. We've got to have someone at the top who understands what has happened and not be in denial about it. it does. You can't expect 83% of white men to understand the minorities in, our, in the communities that they work. You talk about community policing. How can it be community policing if you don't understand the community? Or if you're not really involved in the community? These people are coming from very different backgrounds where they may not have even known a person. But yet and still, and so they bring those by, they bring those also those thoughts with them. You know, you've seen the social media comments that so many police officers make about their feelings and thoughts about black people. You know, some of it's just, that's the way they think and that's been ingrained in them as, you know, probably from birth. But some of it's because they don't understand, they don't know any better. 
and what they see on the six o'clock news about, you know, a young man, that's that may be what that's not the majority of the people in our community. My son was 24 years old, you know, um, college graduate, wonderful young man, doing all the right things with his life. But whenever I talked about a homicide and him being murdered, to a, being shot to death at two o'clock in the morning, I felt the need to have to defend who he was as a black male. He wasn't a thug, he wasn't a gangbanger, but the idea of the fact that he was murdered, most people think, well, he was a thug. He was doing this, that, and the other. He was doing all kind of criminal activity. No, never, never. The coroner's report reported no drugs, no alcohol, nothing in his system. And him and his friends are, that's who they are. But if you, if you pay attention to only the perspective that the media sometimes gives you, you know, the only thing you know about is what you see. There are young men that are graduating from more state, more college, more house college and doing wonderful things with their life, but that doesn't get reported. So I'm hoping now in the opportunity tonight to be able to share my perspective on many young black men in this country that are doing wonderful things. And you and everybody, you know, needs to understand that. You know, the people that are committing the crime, and oftentimes people will say, well, what's wrong with them? I oftentimes now ask what happened to them. Peaceful protesting is a God-given right. Um, and I support that. I don't support looting or any of those kinds of things that we've seen. Um, but as I said earlier, oftentimes a riot is the language of those unheard. You know, there's something going on in these communities where you see that kind of behavior, um, that their voices are not being heard. Um, as far as defunding the police, I don't know that that's the answer to everything. I think there's, there's dollars that need to go to, say for instance, mental health. You know, should a police officer be answering a call for someone who's clearly having a, an episode, a mental health episode? like we saw in Rochester, New York. Maybe had a mental health person with the dollars that that police officer would pay to go to that, that scene. Maybe had a mental health person been there 